Good morning, Wellspring. We are glad that you are here with us. Looking forward to speaking with you today. Uh, my name is Keith Buttemeyer. I am the care and missions guy here on staff. I think I've been on staff longer than anybody except for Andy. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. I'm the old guy on staff. It's easy to pick me out uh, in a crowd. Uh, thank you for thinking that. Thank you for agreeing silently uh, to that statement. Barry did a great job last week. We're, we're just starting a new series. This is the second in this new series called In the Beginning, God. And uh, we're looking at some of the patriarchs that have been uh, those pillars of faith, the big stories, the big shots in the Old Testament. And uh, Barry last week came in with uh, the story of Abraham's call. Now, just to, to refresh you a little bit, when Abraham starts, his name is Abram, and his name will later be changed to Abraham. I may end up using those terms interchangeably. Please forgive me. They're both the same guy. Uh, last week, Abraham's call, uh, presented by, by Barry, was uh, laid some foundational work for what the covenant will be. And, and we'll talk about what a covenant is, and we'll talk about the very unusual way this covenant is set up. Uh, but Abraham's obedience to God is really the, the key thing that we're looking at. It's, it's incredible that here's a guy who comes out of a, a polytheistic background, a, a, a culture where there are multiple gods, you know, and, and they change from, from group to group or tribe to tribe or city to city. And God calls him out knowing what type of man he was, what type of heart he had. And uh, what's neat is, and in today's passage, it says this, Abraham believed what God said, and God credited it to him as righteousness. So in chapter 12 of Genesis, we see the substance of the covenant to come. And this is what is considered the call of Abraham. God says to Abram, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that's a very key statement, that last little bit. All the earth would be blessed through Abraham. And this constitutes his call. What we will be looking at today is the covenant. Now, uh, we're going to primarily be in Genesis chapter 15, if you'd like to follow along uh, on your app or whatever access to a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we have some uh, approximately in at least every other seat. If you need a Bible at home and don't have one, you're welcome to take one of those with you. Uh, we want them to be available to you anytime you would need one. Uh, we'll be in page nine in those uh, Bibles in the seats, if that's what you are, are going to be using. And let me say this as well. We're hopping along in these chapters a little bit. We're, it's a little bit like playing the Bible version of The Floor is Lava. So we're, we're hopping from this time frame to this time frame as we go chronologically and touch on the things that are pertinent to this series. Um, and, but that doesn't mean we're, we're, we're uh, giving you the full story. So feel free to go back. Check in, there's some good reading between these gaps here. Uh, we'll be in chapter 15, but in chapter 14, Abram goes all Liam Neeson on some bad guys, and it's pretty nice. Uh, I don't, if you have boys, you might want to read that to them. And they, he, he goes and cleans up some dudes that were threatening uh, Lot, his, his nephew, and that's pretty neat. But now we're in, in chapter 15, and the... the the tenor of things changes quite a bit. Genesis 15, starting at the first verse. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? Since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, 
and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now, let me say this about Abram. Abraham is a patriarch, okay? He is a pillar of faith. He is a mega man of holiness. But you need to remember as you read through this, at this point in the story, he is just a guy who is in a relatively new relationship with God. And, and it's, it's come to him from out of the blue. He doesn't have a whole lot of history with this Yahweh who has a plan for his life. It's a good plan. It's a much better plan than Abram has on his own. But, but there's still that, that need to figure out what does this God want from me and does he follow through on everything he says? Is there going to be, I don't know, there are some things in here I'm just not sure about. Talk to Abraham now. I mean, like, like when I die, I'm going to schedule right away. You got to get up into heaven. You got to schedule coffee with all the big shots. The things that you want to see their video or talk to him and get their firsthand account about what really happened and what it felt like and what, what, what was it like. Did you really see whales as you crossed the Red Sea just swimming alongside? Super cool stuff. Uh, but that Abraham is going to be, yes, mega man of God. He has a whole lifetime of experience to lean on of God following through every one of his promises. But as we look at this passage in 15, he is just really getting a feel for who this Yahweh is. And he's, he's followed through. He's been solid. But at this point in the story, the reply that comes out of Abram's mouth is not what you might expect or what you might recommend. But it's this. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know? Like, yeah, I think of all the things you could possibly reply to God when he tells you his plan. How can I be sure is probably on the bottom three, no matter how many choices you have, millions of choices. Don't just turn right around and question God on what's going on. Does this remind you of anything, though? Does this remind you of anything in the New Testament? This threw me over into Mark chapter 9 in the New Testament. Jesus is working with, with the crowds who are gathered around. This is early in his ministry. And he's dealing with needs and he's teaching and he's interacting. And up runs this man who says, my son has convulsions. He has this spirit that has him and he's possessed by it. And these convulsions throw him, have thrown him into the water trying to drown him, thrown him into the fire trying to kill him there. If you can do anything, have pity on us. And Jesus says, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. And the father immediately exclaims, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. I love the frankness of that recognition that, yes, I believe in God. I want to trust God fully. Help me to trust you fully, God. I need just a little bit of boost. But seeing a phrase like this happen in Old and New Testament and seeing that God doesn't blow up on the person that says it gives me some hope for my own shortcomings. I have enough days that I have to struggle with, with self-doubt. I don't want any of you ever, and, and no one on staff would ever want it, do not think that the people who show up on stage here have all their ducks in a row. Don't think that the people who are up here magically have this intimacy with God, this walk with God that you would never have because that's not the case. Praise be to God that he uses imperfect people and pours his grace out on those who are willing to give themselves to him and to serve him. That is the only reason I'm able to be up here. You know how many days in the week I wake up and think, I probably shouldn't be, I probably shouldn't be here. I probably don't really qualify to be here. I'm not sure I belong. Some weeks, it's as many days as I wake up. Yet, in my self-doubt, I still do not doubt God's control, God's ability to handle things, God's purpose, God's plan. It's just, I don't know, sometimes I feel like God has this great big plan and I'm just really small. And maybe I don't really fit. But passages like this give me confidence to say, Sovereign Lord, how can I know? Which turns out really isn't too bad a phrase. And in this moment, 
Abram shows this powerful humanity, just this plain mundaneness. And Barry brought this up last week in his message. Abram isn't light years ahead of us in his faith. He's a regular person who has just started a very long journey of obedience that will produce incredible faith. But at this point, just him believing what God says is enough to be counted as righteousness. That long journey, that's what produces a mega man, mega woman of holiness. So, Abram says, how can I know? And this is where things get really bizarre in this passage. Genesis 15, starting in verse 9. So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, and he cut them in two, and he arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. All right. Bizarre enough, right? Your kids have never brought a, a bring home page from Sunday school with a picture of this that they've colored. <laughs> and that's because we care. <laughs> we care for your kids. And uh, lawsuits are ugly, messy things. So I'm going to give you, I, I have to give you an image that I think will help, but I want to give you the story that's semi-interesting, probably more to me than to you, of how I came about this image. My son is a youth minister in Campbellsville, Kentucky. My, my wife's right here. She, she, she participated in the whole son thing too, but I'm going to claim him right now. My son is a youth minister in Campbellsville, Kentucky, and we were up there visiting him for, uh, for the holidays around Christmas. And he had a young couple stop in, friends of his, young married couple, John and Emily. And they, they dropped in, and we had a great time. They were really, really neat people. And the, the young lady, Emily, comes up to me and says, I understand that you're from Columbia. And I said, yes. She says, I am too. I'm like, Tennessee, Columbia, Tennessee? And she says, yeah. And there's, there's a test that uh, ever since I've been from Columbia, I, I run this test. It helps filter out the people from California. So the, if, <laughs> if, you, um, if they say, I'm from Columbia, I live in Columbia, I say, do you know where the Jumbo House is? How many of you know where Jumbo House is? Oh, look at all these people. Some of you have a long way to grow if you're going to stick around. The Jumbo House is this, this old school, it used to be a drive-in hamburger joint, now it's just sit your bottom down hamburger joint, and it's a great place to eat if your heart doctor is not in town for the week. <laughs> it's good, it's good. And she says, yes, I know where the Jumbo House is, and I'm like, this is crazy, it's such a small world. Here we are, I'm, I'm in the next state over, and I meet somebody who is a Jumbo House hamburger eater-in-law. Isn't that wonderful? Her dad is a minister. He, he preaches at West 7th Street Church of Christ there in Columbia, and she grew up in Columbia. So now she's in, in Campbellsville, uh, where my son is, and my wife's son is there too. I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Her sister is named Marcy Yoder, and she is an artist teacher who lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it just so happens that Marcy painted a watercolor of the scene that I just described, okay? So <laughs> this is, this, I don't think this will make anyone faint, but this was hanging in my son's house, and I was just mesmerized by it. Here, here's what it is. This is the watercolor of laying out this weird covenant situation. It's like, yeah, that's a bizarre one, but when you know the story and you apply it, it's, very, it's a very powerful image, and I love having something like that. That's, to me, that's the measure of good art if it keeps drawing my eye to it and if it reminds me of something powerful, and that's what this does because of this covenant. By the way, if you're on Etsy, there's only one more print of this available if you'd like to hang it over your, your dinner in your dinner area just to mess with people as they come in. What is that? In Genesis 15, continuing on with this account, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that 
400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they'll be enslaved and mistreated there. But I'll punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they'll come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land. From the wadi of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. God basically tells Abram in response to his, how can I know? God says, do you want to know how you can know? How about I give you details of all your future history, more than you could even think to ask for. Here's how it goes, Abram. 400 years, your ancestors are going to be in a place that doesn't belong to them. They're going to end up enslaved and mistreated in that place. Yet they're going to come out of it loaded with wealth. That makes no sense historically that the slave people come out of a place loaded with wealth. But as you read in Exodus, it's the case. And you will die a good ripe old age in peace. But 400 years from now, four of their generations, which were longer at the time, your people will come back to this land and start claiming it as their own. And then God says, Abram, you ask, how can I know? Let me do this in a framework that you'll understand. And that's why we have this picture. This is a framework that he was familiar with. You'll notice in the story, God says, bring me a heifer, bring me a ram. But he doesn't say what to do with them. Yet Abram automatically knows, all right, I've got to saw these dudes in half. I'm going to drag some over to one side, some over the other side. That's because in the cultures of that area, a covenant looked like this. They would take those animals and cut them in half. And I don't know, artistically, she has them laid out, uh, cut in half lengthwise. As, as a person who's processed some, some meat on my own, that, that is a, that's a difficult way to do it. I don't know that that's how it happened, or if he just went cross-section, I'd go cross-section. Any way you look at it, it is a visceral, gory, nasty thing. The things that were a part of the worship of God and tethered to sin were very visceral things back then. And if you can imagine, if you cut it in half and then you drag half of it over here and half of it over here, the middle ground is just a gore fest of nastiness, not anything that you'd want to walk through. And this, this is misleading a little bit. This looks like a sacrifice. This is not a sacrifice. This is not an offering to God. This is a covenant ceremony. And as you arrange the animals, the, the animals on one side can, can be representative of one part of that covenant, that contract, and the animals on the other side would be on the other part of this. And then the, the parties of the covenant would walk through in that gory, bloody ground. And it was, it was how they, they both took part in the promise. And in this instance, it looks like, sounds like, God enters into the picture a little bit like a junior version of what we sometimes refer to as the Shekinah glory. The, when God presents as a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud or a combination in there. If you remember, as, as Israel leaves Egypt, the pillar of cloud is there. And when the Egyptian army comes up right behind them, the pillar of cloud moves and stands between so that the, Egypt, the Egyptian army can't uh, attack. And then as they go through the Red Sea, the pillar is there. And as they go through the wilderness, the pillar is there. And as they get to Mount Sinai, and Moses gets the law handed down. The entire top of the mountain is covered in this fiery, blazing, smoking, intimidating picture. And this is what we see in perhaps a vision. It says he comes in as, a, as like a fire pot of coals and yet this smoke. And I think there's, surely there's this blaze inside the smoke. And it comes down 
and it crosses between the animals that are laid out as part of the covenant promise. And by, by passing through, it's tantamount to a much more serious version of a promise that, than cross my heart, hope to die. You can finish that phrase, right? I, I, I know I had a twisted childhood. Cross my heart, hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. Thank you, thank you. We're, we'll be teaching the kids that too. This is really, I've, we've, I've lived through some stuff, y'all. Uh, uh, to be this old and to still be around is great. I'm excited. God comes through as this blazing pot, and in doing so, the promise is this. If, if this covenant fails on my part, make me as these animals are. I should be dismembered. I should be cut in half. I should be cast aside. I should be bloody and gory if I fail in my covenant promise with you, my partner. And here's an intriguing little thing that, that's unique to this situation is Abram never gets up and walks the promise. Only God walks the promise. That's really unusual because even if it was a, a higher authority that you would swear by and a lower authority entering into a contract, maybe the higher authority wouldn't walk through, but the lower authority always did. It was his promise he was, he was banking on. He had nothing to offer. He, he had to be a part of this promise and say, yes, I'll do whatever, whatever, in order to enter into this covenant with you. But this doesn't happen. God instead walks it alone by his own choice. It's his covenant. It's his agreement. It's his offering to Abram and all of his descendants. It's very unusual. God uses his own omnipotence, his own faithfulness, his own perfection, his own timeliness, his own supremacy as being guarantor, as being collateral for the promise. God just co-signed a contract with someone who he knows cannot pay his side of the covenant. But why would he do that? And I think he does that because he knows that his people that Abraham's descendants have to be connected to him in order to have a chance because without him, they cannot make it. By this action, God gives his promise to the people through Abraham when he said, your people will be as countless as the stars in the sky. My blessing will come to the whole world through you. And by connecting Abraham and his descendants to himself through this covenant, Abraham's descendants continue to have access to God, even though they're not worthy of it. They continue to have access to God's word and instruction, even though they're not worthy of it. They continue to become a people of God's promise, even though they're not worthy of it. And they continue to learn how to live lives and lead lives and teach their, their children to live correctly, morally, justly, and most of all, righteously, even though they're not qualified themselves, and they're not worthy. But over it all, it is what keeps God's people into a relationship. It keeps them tethered to him so that they always know in reflection that our God is a God of loving kindness. So, you might be wondering, what's the point? What does this have to do with me? This is between God and Abraham. This is not my business. I'm not Hebrew. I'm not Jewish. This is not for me. I'm one of the people of the New Testament. This, all of this is crumbly, dry, ancient history that takes place in another time with another people on another continent. And it seems to me that it's kind of a pointless waste of time because I don't need Abraham's covenant, right? Unless, and this has just come to me, <laughs> Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. It's page 796 if you're using one of our Bibles. It says this, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, for all of you who were baptized into Christ 
have now clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There is not male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. So I don't know how bad your day might have started, but it's looking up now because you're in God's will. You are one of the heirs of God. The promise that is made in this bloody ground has now transitioned. It has been left to you. Your name shows up in his final wishes, and his final wish is that you would be part of the covenant and that the blessings promised through Abraham would land on you and the world would continue to be blessed through you. Here's something you should never forget about God. He has excellent eyesight. His vision is unmatched. He can see what's coming. He knows what's going to happen. And when it comes to playing the long game, nobody does it like God does. Abraham says, basically, I'm just a childless old guy living out of my luggage who doesn't own an acre to his name. And God says, no, listen, just work with me. It'll be good. Dream coat Joseph says, I'm the baby of the family and everyone but my own dad hates me. My own brothers just sold me to slave traders. And God says, ah, just work with me. Moses says, I'm a washed up foster Egyptian who's been rejected by both of his peoples. And I have a hard time stringing enough words together to carry on a, 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 what's, what's the, a, a conversation. And God says, ah, just work with me. David says, I'm the bottom of my family's totem pole. The only thing I'm good at is singing shepherd songs and playing my guitar for the sheep. And God says, ah, come on, just work with me. And everyone since the day Abraham watched God walk out a covenant agreement with him says, I am just me. I am weak. I am imperfect. I make huge mistakes. I'm sometimes mean and selfish and thoughtless and depressive and mocking and angry. And I'm some other things that I really don't even care to say out loud. I don't have a chance of keeping up this covenant promise with you. And God says, I didn't make the covenant to see you end up like a heifer or a goat or a ram. For the time being, animals will be sacrificed. Animals will be in your place. Animals will be the penalty so that you will never forget the price of sin nor the promise that I have made here today. The time is coming when all of that will be painfully clear, but for now, just work with me. And in a beautiful transition to the New Testament, we're going to take a leap over to Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 13, page 819. When God had made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. He said, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all the arguing. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may greatly be encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Jesus fulfills this covenant, this Abrahamic covenant. And this is required. The fulfillment is needed since God walked it for both parties. God himself holds the, the, the check. He's been given the bill. He has to somehow be cut off to be made like those animals, to be dead and lifeless because that is the penalty of the oath that he took and he alone because Abram never walked it. For years, Abraham's people 
Their fidelity, their faithfulness to God waxed and waned. Their sins piled up. But it was God who was left holding the check. And so, how does it apply to us? Jesus Christ completes the penalty of the old covenant by becoming as lifeless, as bloody, as gory as the animals that were advertised as the penalty for failure. Jesus fulfills in death the penalty required for the old covenant to end, to be completed. And how can he do that? Because he is a direct descendant of both sides of the agreement. Because Jesus is God, yet he's man, right? Joseph could trace his lineage all the, back, all the way back to Abraham, but Joseph was not really the father of Jesus. Mary, however, could trace her lineage all the way back to Abraham. So he's representative on man's side. Because Jesus is God, and yet man is the flip side of that coin is going to be Jesus is man and yet God. And that takes us into Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He represents man. He represents God. He is the first one to come to a point in this where he can bring the sides of the covenant together. Isaiah 53 says, Surely Jesus took on up our pain and bore our sufferings, yet we considered him to be punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And if Jesus were anybody else, the penalty would have been paid and it would have stopped there. And the witnesses to it would have walked away, depressed to see someone have to pay the price, someone die. But Jesus had a mastery over death that meant that, yeah, he died, but he got better. And he comes out of death into life And he stands up again, and he declares the old covenant satisfied because he died. That is the price. And it's almost as if he comes through the bloody ground and reconnects the animals and breathes life into them because he is the creator. He is the one that life comes from. He removes death completely from the promise, from the covenant. It has been satisfied, it is no more. And he establishes by the name Messiah that there is a new covenant. And he, by his power, by his death and resurrection, has the authority to offer life and grace to every and any participant who will be made sufficient to the promise. And so God and man, once at disparity, once separated one from another, are now fully reconciled. Earlier, I mentioned how a lifetime of walking with God is how you become a mega follower of Jesus. I'd like to tell you for a few minutes about one lady that I think fits that bill. Miss Beverly came to Wellspring just a few years ago. She came by herself, came on her own. Turns out she lived just across the street from here. And she came up and she sat in the front row. It was her first Sunday. She came right up and sat where the crazy people sit. (laughs) And my wife and I are over there in our perennial spot. I know we don't have an Afghan that we leave there to hold our place, but you know that those are our seats. Please don't ever sit there. (laughs) And we saw she sat alone and we thought, we're crazy. We'll go sit with her, make sure she doesn't cause any ruckus. Miss Beverly's about this tall. And she's just this super sweet lady. Imagine if, if a grandmother that you didn't know is offering you milk and cookies, it's probably Miss Beverly's face that you're imagining right now. And I really got to meet Miss Beverly over this, the course of this past year. 
she had a health issue that had come up where she had a wound in her leg, in her upper thigh, that continued to fester. And no matter what they did, it just wouldn't heal. And they'd, they'd bring her in and they'd do surgery and they'd, they'd cut away tissue and they'd open that up and they'd pack it and they'd give her medications. And, and it would slowly get a little better and then it wouldn't be. And they'd, they'd take the packing out and they'd debride the old dying flesh and they'd repack it and they'd give her more medicines. And they'd do another surgery and they'd, they'd clean it out and they'd bring her back and she'd, they'd pack it. And this just went on and on for over 10 months, surgery after surgery after surgery on this wound. It would start even to heal over the top. The skin would start to grow together, but the inside was a mess and they'd have to cut it back and open it up again. For more than 10 months, this continued on. And then one day, I got the news. They had found somehow that they had overlooked a football-sized cancerous tumor in that thigh. I don't even want to go into what it takes to miss a football-sized tumor in a lady as small as Miss Beverly. But they gave her two options. The first option they said wouldn't work and wasn't really an option. The second option is we just take the whole leg. Listen, if you need a distraction at the hospital, I'm your guy. Call me up. If you're one squirrel short in your cage, I'll step in. I'm, if you're in the waiting room and your loved one's having surgery, I will come and crack jokes with you and, and, and try to take your mind off of all the things that you might be thinking in worst case scenarios. But please do not call me and ask me if I think that you should let them take your leg. I did not have a class in ministry school that helps me with that. And I called her. I was, I was in traffic driving through Neapolis on 31. And I found myself totally empty if there anything to say. She was on the phone with me. I, said, I finally just said, Beverly, this is hard. What I was really saying was, I don't know how to help you. And she said, I know what, honey. Everybody's, I don't know, I don't think everybody, I think it's me. <laughs> I know it, honey. She said, they're, they're going to try to make me stronger because they, they don't think I could survive the surgery now, but you know what? I'm not scared, really. If, I, if I'm not strong enough to make it through surgery, then they'll just put me to sleep. And when I wake up, I'll see Jesus. There was not a question or trace of doubt in her voice. And somebody cynical could easily say, well, she's the product of a lifetime of superstitious belief and nonsense, the way ignorant people have believed for years. Of course she would say that. But Miss Beverly and I would say, well, she's the logical result of a lifetime of obedience to and dependence on a God who loves her, the way faithful people have believed for years. Of course she'd say that. I called her to ask her if it'd be okay to use her story. I said, did you get the text I sent you earlier this week? She said, no, honey. But apparently she went looking for it. Because yesterday she sent this text to me. Can I use your story? She says, yes. Use all you want as a testimony for the glory of God and how he takes care of his children if we stay faithful to him. I love you all and I thank everyone for the prayers that they've prayed for me. It will be a while, but one of these days I'll be back. Love you. She had her leg removed. She's been in and out of a therapy place and back to the hospital, and there have been difficulties. They're talking about maybe letting her go home soon with a wheelchair, and I told her that I would present her prayer need to a group of people who would support her and to pray for her. It's that lack of doubt that makes you a mega follower of faith. The ability to know that whatever it looks like around me, no matter how bloody and bad it looks, my God 
will save me. So the question for us is, how do we walk this new covenant that Jesus Christ has established? How do we walk through not the death of animals, but the death of God's own son, the perfect, complete sacrifice, the only sufficient one? In case you didn't hear it the first time, I'll take you right back to Galatians chapter 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and the heirs according to the promise. If you have never chosen to follow Christ into the new covenant that he's instituted, what we have today is the time, the opportunity, and goodness, we even have the water warmed up to perfection. What we can't offer you today is a better time than now to answer the call of Christ. It's time to let Jesus be your shield and your very great reward. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, what a magnificent offer that we are not worthy of. We do not deserve. Yet you call to us in our imperfection because you love us and because you are able to pay a price to cover our sins and to make us presentable to you, to completely reconcile us with you and to give us your future. Thank you, Lord, for writing us into the will of your heart and giving us this opportunity to bless the world and to receive the blessing ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen.